Hi, and welcome to Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter Director's Roundtable. I'm your host, Rebecca Keegan, and I'm delighted to welcome our guests, Lee Isaac Chung, George Clooney, Paul Greengrass, Regina King, Spike Lee, George C. Wolfe, and Chloe Zhao. Let's dive right in. Uh, 2020 was a year of doing things differently. Case in point, the way we're meeting today, we are not gathered in a studio. Our guests are joining us from all over the world. I want to ask you, what is the thing you learned about yourself that surprised you during the pandemic? Uh, let's start with you, Regina. Uh, well, of course, I'm the lucky person that gets asked first. Uh, <laughs> the thing that surprised me the most about myself, um, I guess that I have more patience than I thought I had um, prior to the pandemic. Um, I started planting a garden and uh, a vegetable garden and pulling out the weeds by hand so that I don't uh, rock the boat by each of the, you know, the kale or the peppers or whatever it was that I was growing, that takes a lot of time. And um, I found that normally I probably would have been super uh, frustrated and just had someone else do it, but I was very patient through it. And then also with the technology, I, it has not frustrated me the way one would think it would. I've been very patient with it. <laughs> George Clooney, you're laughing. What did you learn about yourself that surprised you during the pandemic? Well, mostly I learned uh, that R Regina is pulling these plants out by her hand. And that, <laughs> to me, is, that's, that's been the, the biggest step. You know, I think we're, we've all kind of learned uh, a, a lot of the same lessons. We, you know, we're we're doing things that some things we haven't done in a while. Uh, some of us, you know, um, we're we're learning to uh, we're learning how deeply we need to be in contact with one another. Uh, we, I, I learned that I, uh, I I really need to spend more time with my parents, you know, who are in their upper 80s. And uh, so I, I learned you, I think you get back. You, I've learned to get back to the things that actually matter in life and. You know, listen, I do a lot of diaper changing, you know, and that's not even for the kids. That's just for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's about it. Chloe, what about you? I think I'm with Re Regina. You know, I, I never knew how much I would love this three chickens that I, I got at the beginning of the pandemic. I was like, I'm never going to have eggs anymore because supermarkets ran out of them. So I got three little chicks and the patience of watching them grow <laughs> and then to give you eggs one day and also just the little triumphs that we we are we take for granted that our ancestors uh are satisfied with you know mm. chop wood carry water mm. um i just did laundry this morning and felt pretty damn good mm. what about you paul <laughs> same really i think i think it's uh been an opportunity in a strange way for a simpler life you know i haven't been on an airplane for a long long time and just walking in the woods, bringing you closer to the natural world for sure. Appreciating, you know, the leaves coming on the trees earlier in the year and falling off later in the year. That that was, you know, the drama of it all. That mm. was wonderful. Um, and as George said, you know, get in touch with this, with the things that matter. Mm -hmm. Spike, how about you? Well, at the beginning of this pandemic. I was wondering, what am I going to do with all this time on my hands? Because I've been, you know, I'm just, I'm working all the time, working, teaching, you know, breakneck pace. And I amazed myself that I was able to slow down and uh, live. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, it had to slow down. Mm -hmm. Had no choice. Mm -hmm. And Isaac, how about you? Um, I guess for me, I, I tend to be really introverted. So I thought in some way there would be a positive element to this where I can just hold away and, and write and, and do stuff like that. But 
Um, like George was saying, I, I, I really miss people. I miss just being able to go out and see friends when I want. And um, there's just this freedom you feel in knowing that there, there are people out there who you can just go and see. Uh, but that maybe that's taken away from us right now. And that's, that's been pretty sad. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's all about the people for me. Mm -hmm. George Wolf, how about you? Uh, uh, just the, the phenomenon of standing still, mm. you know, because I move a lot and I do a lot and I like to stay busy. And all of a sudden, you know, I was three weeks shy of completing post on Ma Rainey. Then all of a sudden everything stopped and I, you know, screamed for about a month. And then after that, you know, I started standing still and listening and finding calm and order in that and rediscovering the value of that. Mm. Because, you know, you know, it's New York and you want to do everything. And then all of a sudden you thoughts happen and feelings happen and all sorts of things come up. And so that's been really great. Just just being exposed to what's going on inside that I don't oftentimes listen to. Mm -hmm. Were there moments that emerged in the performances that caused you to to take a different direction than you expected? It, I, I don't think it was as much take a different direction, but. You know, I was afforded a, a we had a two week rehearsal period with, you know, prior to anything being shot, which was really great because I wanted the actors to, you know, form an ensemble, but also find liberation inside of using this incredibly thick, rich, complicated language. So so that was achieved there. And it was also time for them to focus in on mastering as much as they possibly can those damn instruments. Mm -hmm. So 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 so, <laughs> so there was a lot of preparation time that that was done in terms of, of of that. But then once the filming happened, it was just creating space so that the velocity and the rawness of the performances were given space to to just erupt and go as deep and as complicated as, as they possibly could. I mean, so there really wasn't any startling surprises. It was just, you know, creating safe space so that therefore this degree of emotional nakedness could take place. Mm -hmm. And then one was perpetually startled by how amazingly brilliant and raw people got inside their performances. But it, that, was, that was sort of fundamentally it. There was no violent shocks or anything that changed. How many of you used rehearsals? If, like, show of hands. Just, Spike, how come? I, we didn't have the time. No time, Regina? <laughs> well, wanted to, but didn't have the time. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Um, Spike, how come? Why did you why did you have rehearsals for Five Bloods? Well, we always rehearsed, and we also shot this in Thailand and Vietnam, so we were there. You were in place. Yeah, you know, ensemble everybody's together, and uh, you become uh, tight. Mm -hmm. I mean, these guys mm -hmm. have 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 known each other for forty years. They're going back to Vietnam when they were. 18, 90 years old, so we wanted to see that uh, closeness on the screen when the camera rolled. Mm -hmm. Isaac, you you used rehearsals as well. How come and how long? Um, it's kind of interesting. It's the reverse of Spike because we had Korean actors coming to the U.S. and going to Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> so <laughs> we were there, you know. I, I know that feeling. We were in a house, basically, and... Uh, uh, it was just a week of rehearsals and going through all the lines together and reshaping the script together. Those were like such precious days together. Um, it's great when it's great when you can have when you when it could be put in the budget that you can get rehearsal. You, you can't. Yeah, it's it's a win win. You know, if you can get it, mm -hmm. take it. Yeah, I don't ever see a situation where. Um, I guess not having a rehearsal works better than having rehearsal. I mean, we did have the opportunity to sit down together and have a table read and sit down and just kind of have our come to Jesus moment between myself and um, I call them uh, the quadrumvirate, uh, the four actors and, and to just go through the entire script and talk about the dialogue and um, some of the changes that I had made uh, to the dialogue and scenes that I had omitted and new scenes that I'd put in. So we did have that moment together and that was very helpful, but I would have loved to have had 
um, a week of rehearsals. But next one, I'll have more money and more time. I refuse to. Yeah, I, ref I, I, I said I can't I can't do it without the two weeks. If mm -hmm. you know, I have to have time with the actors, mm -hmm. and it's the only way we could do it. I tried for three, but I ended up with two, so <laughs> it worked out. Well, let's talk about working with actors a little bit. Um, George Clooney, how is it directing George Clooney? Oh, it's fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's nothing more fun than directing yourself. <laughs> it's a, it's, I hear he's it's, difficult. I mean, <laughs> well, I tell you, at least the uh, the actor knew what the director wanted. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's a it's a tr it's a tricky thing. You know, R Regina's an actress as well, and she knows w what it's like. You know, you don't want to. You're breaking rules, right? You're breaking rules at actors. If Regina and I were doing a scene together, uh, in general, two actors, I wouldn't then at cut say, "Okay, could you do it a little faster?" You know, it's it's that the type of thing that actors should never break ever. You know, uh, and it's a very you have to have trust with other actors to be able to do it. To do it with yourself, it's you know, I have a my best buddy and producing pal for forty years, Grant who sits behind a monitor and, you know, you want to do less takes on yourself than you want to do on other people because you look like a schmuck otherwise. And so, you know, you do, you know, you do a couple of takes and you go, you know, that's fine. And then Grant will stick his head out and go, do another take. Go, okay. All right. You know. Regina, how come George, you didn't. Did you, did you go to the monitor? Oh, sorry. No, sorry. Go ahead. Paul. Yeah, I went to the monitor. Yeah, I would go to the monitor. You went to the well, After every take and then look and then a second. No, no, no. Yeah, you know. No, not after every take. I do kind of, I, when it was me on camera, I do like a run of two or some three or something. I didn't have, there weren't that long scenes, you know. And then the ice, you couldn't stay out that long. Maybe 60 seconds and you were back in. Where did you shoot it? Iceland. Iceland. Yeah. That was, that was fun. It looks cold. <laughs> <laughs> and Regina, why did you opt not to act in your film? Oh, because I've had that experience uh, once before um, when I was acting and directing an episode of Southland, a show that I was on a few years back, and I don't want to ever do that again. Mm -hmm. I just, it was, I applaud, you know, George and Don Cheadle. Uh, just, I, it just blows me away that you are able to just... I don't know. I, I just, my brain just doesn't want to work like that again. I felt like something was missing. And I guess you're going to always kind of feel like that anyway as, 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 a, as a director. But I just felt like I just was not giving my all to either. <clears throat> you know, I was, it was mm. maybe, maybe with the patience <laughs> I have now. <laughs> if I uh, am ever um, asked to do that again, I'll, I'll, I'll reconsider. Uh, but it, it's it's it takes a lot of you're, you're exercising kind of two different muscles in your brain at the same time, acting and directing, and um, it's it's a big thing to ask of yourself. Chloe, having worked prior to Nomadland with people who aren't professional actors and then going to working with Frances McDormand, what was that transition like for you? Did she adjust to your style? Did you adjust to hers? How did it work? I think Brian is a dream to work with. You know, she, she, there's a huge part of her is Fran. You know, she is many, in many ways playing a version of herself. But for me, like, there's always three babies on set for me. You know, there's the, the cast, there's a world and there's a camera. And uh, I, there are times I have to decide who I'm favoring and who I'm compromising. It's a constant negotiation, it's never easy. But Fran is a dream to work with uh, in terms of bringing a professional actor into a situation like this because she doesn't matter what the non-professional actors throw at her, she's constantly present. She never for a moment go, oh, that's not what I prepared. That's not what's on the pages. Her capacity to connect as a human being, to listen, is a huge um, um, help for me to draw the performance out of my non-professional actors. Mm -hmm. um, 
Spike and, and George Wolf, uh, your films are sadly the, the last work we have from Chadwick Boseman. And I'm curious if you could talk at all about did you know what he was physically struggling with at the time he was doing both of these quite demanding roles? George Wolf, if you if you want to start, what, you know what was what was Chadwick yeah. like on set? Ch Chadwick was like he he was. I I knew absolutely nothing. I knew absolutely. I had no sense wow. of it. You know, he was. He would do take after take of these deep, raw, emotional moments. At there's a moment in the film where he breaks through this door, and and he kicked at the door so violently that the door shattered, and we had to figure out how to put it together. So every single thing that he was doing had this incredibly intense level of of, of of commitment to it. He was thinner, but I just, you know, I thought he was fasting or something like that. But there was no indication emotionally or physically that anything other, anything else was going on. And, you know, and then, you know, finished, you, we finished uh, working with him. And then afterwards, he and I would, you know, talk about, you know, I sent him a script. He sent me a script. We would talk about maybe we were going to do a play. Then he saw a draft of that. And then a, 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 a version of, of the film. And then we talked after that. And then we had an ADR session in June. So there was no indication other than the future and other than a ferocious commitment mm -hmm. to what he was doing in the moment. And then I found out when the world found out. Mm -hmm. And Wow. It was just, you know, devastating and shocking because I sensed nothing else was going on other than an actor giving every single ounce of he of what he had to make that the character in the film and the moments come alive. So, mm -hmm. no, not at all. Spike, what about on The Five Bloods? I mean, you guys were in a remote location. It was very hot. He's playing a war hero. How How was he? I did not know. George, I asked George. George didn't know. I asked Ryan Coogler. He said he didn't know. I don't, we didn't know. There was a very small circle that knew he was not going to be here from that much longer. And I understand why he did not want people to know. If I would have known, I mean, the, the, the first battle sequence in the film is 100 degrees, and he, we have shots. We have to run 50 yards like using bolt. I mean, he has to haul it. If he tells me that automatically, I'm not going to make him, I'm going to, I'm just have to react. I'm not going to push him as hard as I can. I can't talk to other films, but my film, I didn't know. And he did not want any shortcuts. That's why I didn't say nothing. Any special treatment, didn't want it. I believe, I haven't talked to nobody, this is my belief. He knew his time was coming. And I think that he asked God for one more film, and that was going to be The Five Bloods, and God gave him one more with Ma Rainey. That is my belief. Hmm. His team, hair and makeup, and, and his, his, they were incredibly intensely protective of him. And that was my only sense that maybe, but you know, but uh, that's hindsight. But they were so, you know, brilliantly lovely and protective of him, and and saw him through that in an, in an extraordinary way. So, and it was the, the, the I mean, it, in, in retrospect, the love that that and the energy of protection that they showered on that, that they showered on him was just an amazing thing to witness. Mm. And I didn't realize I, I, what that, was going on until. Yeah. Same mm -hmm. thing with, with, with my brother George C. Wolf just said. They were on him. And, you know, he's Black Panther, Jackie Robinson, <laughs> James Brown, Bigger Marshall. So <laughs> I'm thinking, like, maybe there's some Hollywood stuff. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because, George, you notice mm -hmm. they will be on him, praying on him, massaging him, you know, while waiting for a setup. So. I don't know what that was. I wasn't going to disturb it. <laughs> you know, I would do nothing with the process. Mm -hmm. So, but afterwards, like yourself, George, that was, then I thought, aha. Uh -huh. It's interesting. When you watch him, it feels like, it, in Ma Rainey's in particular, the, by the end, you do feel like as an actor, 
you're watching an actor saying, I'm running out of time. I'm going to, I'm going to give it, you know, it's, it is, you know, he's probably going to win the Oscar this year. Uh, he shouldn't win it because he died. It's the, it's the best performance of the year. You know, it, he pours his heart out in that performance. And I, and unfortunately I watch it after he was gone and you're watching it and your mouth is just dropped open the whole time watching this incredible performance. It's just, you know, I just can't believe the loss, you know. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about material. Uh, Isaac, you tell an autobiographical mm -hmm. story in your film, and I'm curious how you chose to turn the lens on your, your own family and your own story. Um, yeah, this, this is actually my fourth film, and in a way, it's what I always wanted to do maybe with my first film, you know, to, to dive in and kind of tell a story of my childhood. But um, I think I, I just needed to go through a lot of different things in life, experience um, becoming a father, uh, experience failures, uh, disappointments, um, a lot of different things that I feel like my, my mom and dad went through when they came uh, to the U.S., um, so it was around the time my daughter became the age that I was uh, back then in, in terms of when this story is set, uh, that I started to see the world more through her eyes. And um, just being able to do that, being able to see the world through her eyes a bit helped me to remember back to, to my childhood and, and gave me that Im impetus to really try to tell this story and, and to remember back what that was like. Regina, in, in your case, you're working from a play. How did you think about <clears throat> adapting from stage to screen? Well, I mean, you know, first thing that you're always thinking, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Wolf uh, uh, was in the same place. You know, you want to, uh, you don't want it to feel like a play, but part of the thing that attracted you to the piece uh, is the dialogue. The words are the star. So it was uh, coming to it with uh, the intention of um, making sure that the dialogue remained the star, uh, but also trying to make sure that there was always a feeling of um, movement or energy, even if uh, we are in the same place for a large part of the uh, uh, of the piece, so um, Kemp Powers, uh, who adapted his own play into the screenplay, um, did a really great job of opening the screenplay up so that we're uh, meeting the four men um, at a time where they're like getting kicked in the gut, you know, and and are are, are uh, uh, a moment that humanizes all of them. So taking that humanity and the vitality that all four of these men possess uh, and translating that into um, the technical choices uh, we, we went with. You know, I would say that I'm not uh, the most, as far as my technical uh, language is probably not so deep, but I'm very clear at explaining what it is that I want to uh, accomplish. And so uh, I, I have a great relationship with my DP, Tammy Riker, and she was very clear uh, uh, that uh, color and saturation was really important to me. And, and that, again, movement in the frame without the camera being a distraction was very important to keep the energy and, and not feel static when we're in the same place for so long. So hopefully uh, that did translate. Um, mm -hmm. I feel good about it. <laughs> As it the, the chemistry, you the chemistry sure? yeah, of your beautiful. cast is it, it, the chemistry of your cast, Regina, is insane. Those four men in that well, you room, know what? It's, it's, the, the casting is incredible. Yeah. And and that's what I felt when I read the script. I knew, like I said, the dialogue was so strong that 
four actors that truly understood mm-hmm. that they were embodying four people and not doing an impersonation mm-hmm. to understand that and that this was a slice of life and that the research is mm-hmm. all of the things that took place in those men's life that led them to this moment right here um, was uh, was part of their research. I would be, you know, that'd be half the battle. So it, it was, Chloe, it, the the casting process was definitely a process, but I, there were just little moments for each of them. You know, a couple of them were sending tapes in because they were in other countries. I think Aldous was in Australia and Kingsley was in London. Um, but there were just little moments with each of them that, and, and I'm sure you guys can relate to this as well, where you go, yeah. It's you. Mm-hmm. You know, there's it's, it's sometimes it may not even be the best reading or the best audition, but it'll be just a little thing that lets you know mm-hmm. they 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 understand the journey mm-hmm. that they're going to have to go on. And um, yeah, the, the 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 cast that the, the quadrumvirate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. Paul, you were you were nodding as Regina was saying, yeah, it's you. You have a, a young actress in your film who was mm-hmm. new to me, and I'm curious how mm-hmm. you cast her, what that process was like. Well, it, 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 it's, it's that thing when you start a film, you always have a sense of what your big challenge is going to be, what the thing that's going to be the most difficult. And uh, I'd never worked with a, a child actor and... Uh, I thought to find an 11 year old girl who could play that part uh, was going to be a great challenge. I knew she had to be German. Um, and uh, I was sent a, cop- a copy of System Crasher that Helena was in. And she was so amazing. I actually knew, I thought, there can't possibly be two 11 year old girls in Germany as good as that. <laughs> and um, she, she, she came over, I met her with her mum, and we did some work in the afternoon. It, it, she was astonishingly good. And so mm-hmm. I thought it was going to be a process of months, seeing lots and lots of people, and it was going to be some agonising decision of should it be her, should it be her. It turned out to be the easiest decision. And then when it came to the first day, you know, you never know, with a, particularly with a young 11-year-old girl how it's going to be with on a big set and tom hanks and all the rest of it i mean the first take i just i forgot all all the anxiety because she was she was so strong and confident and her technique was good and she was emotionally true and she just was superb i thought Mm. Mm-hmm. What was the the scene that technically gave you the most anxiety on your film? We'll start with you, Paul, and then I'm curious to hear from some others. Well, probably there's a there's a sort of shootout in the middle of it um, and a chase. That was probably the hardest thing because it was physically the hardest. I mean, we had to go up a quite a high bluff and we had to climb on ropes. Um, it took sort of two hours to get to positions and then there were all sorts of safety issues once you got there and uh, you know beautiful rattlesnakes everywhere to welcome us and that was quite a challenge and it was amazing actually how quickly you sort of forgot and you know somebody would come up and say oh there's a rattler about eight feet away and you go I'll find don't worry can we shoot you know mm-hmm. uh, but that was that was quite challenging what about you where George were you Clooney? Well, I was, where New were you, Mexico. Oh, you shot? Mm. You were, oh, wow. Mm. New Mexico, wow. just out of San Santa Fe. It'll wear you down. Um, you know, mine was, you know, it's easy. It was, uh, it was the space stuff, you know, the, the space walk and mm. leading to the bleeding out. You know, it's, mm. it, you know, I'd done Gravity with Alfonso. I'd done Solaris with Steven Soderbergh. So I'd worked with some really good directors um, in that. And Alfonso in particular was always ahead of the technology he was always we were waiting for the technology to catch up for the things he was trying to do so what was supposed to take 
you know, a few months took a lot longer because of it. Um, and I was the benefit, I benefited from that in a way. I had some advantages. Some of the technology has caught up and surpassed it, the VR stuff. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's still, you're still putting actors on wires and trying not to cross them up, which is, believe it or not, incredibly complicated. And having them, you know, getting them to be able to speak fast but move slowly because that's what space is. And then getting to the sequence where they're on top of each other for the blood uh, sequence. It was just, you know, I mean, that's not the kind of world I've worked in before. So that was complicated. Mm -hmm. That was all. How many of you, if I could just see a show of hands, how many of you have been in production on something during COVID? You mean post-production? Or, or oh, I was thinking production, but uh, uh, Regina, I think you you did some shooting for One Night in Miami during COVID, right? What what was that like? What was the sort of biggest challenge of it? Um, <laughs> probably waiting for everyone's tests to come back uh, negative. <laughs> um, <laughs> that that created the most anxiety. Um, my test was a test that came back inconclusive or non-conclusive. So that was terrifying. Um, and I knew that from constant meetings with the DGA that if that was the case, you know, the production shouldn't go on. But I wanted to finish my film. So I was, you know, I think as everybody knows, we're always up against uh, some things never go perfectly. So we're always in a solution based, you know, place, you know, we kind of, yes, emotion has to do with it, but you kind of always have to put that to the side. So I put the emotion to the side and just started thinking solution based. Okay. So can we, uh, one of the PAs who had um, a, a negative test, can we get them an iPad and they'll just be, you know, designated person with the iPad with me while I'm directing from home. We ended up not having to do that because we were able to, um, I was able to get another test that came back just in time uh, for us to start shooting. So that was the most, um, that created the most anxiety. And then just the being on set, we're so used to doing things the way we do with them, you know, with not being within six feet of each other and, and, and congregating around a monitor. So it was, uh, it, it was just difficult to reprogram your mind to shoot something that is actually a galvanizing moment, but treat it as though you're all in individual <sighs> bubbles. It, it was, it was, it was very tense. I mean, we got through it and, and everyone was given their A game and wanted the film to be finished and really believed in the story that we were telling. So we got there, but I talked to many of the crew members after the fact and um, it, it was, it was very stressful. You know, no one really spoke about it in the moment. But uh, it was a lot of anxiety because they have the people on set that are like six feet, six feet. You know, as soon as you get, oh, six feet and, and you're like, oh, shit, you know. And uh, but, but when we got through it and um, I went on and shot another film <laughs> as if that wasn't uh, enough anxiety <laughs> for me. <laughs> One of the businesses, many businesses that's been really devastated by the pandemic is the theatrical uh, exhibition business. Um, I'm curious for those of you who have films going in theatrical release, um, and I'll start with you, Chloe. Did you ever consider with Fox Searchlight doing it differently or going to a streamer? What were the options that you weighed? Well, there, there's forces outside ourselves right now that we can't, you know, the pandemic, we don't know how it's going to pan out, uh, was safe. But I was just been thinking about it recently, you know, like this thing right here. There's very few places now in the world, including airplanes, that I have to shut this off, be in a dark room with strangers and be told a story together. Very few places left. And I just think that it's incredibly important that we help preserve that. So we'll do what we can. Yeah, well, yeah. 
I agree. Yeah, Paul, Paul, how how has the pandemic affected the way you are approaching the rollout of News of the World? You obviously shot it with the big screen in mind. Yep. And there aren't any not many around, but but we are going to give it a universe are going to give it a go in in North America and you know, I admire them for for doing that to be fair. I mean, I think it's you know, there's not going to be the business around that normally there would, but but I think we have to. I, I personally believe, th- th- you know, theatres will be back. The cinematic experience will be back. I think by the summer it will look very very different. I think that the vaccines are going to get us back to normal. Uh, I mean, I think that. So I think the first part of the crisis in the business will be surmounted. I think the second part of the crisis, which is the the change and the fact that theatrical is going to have to coexist in some form with streaming, I think is is a change that that is going to stay with us. And all of the, you know, whether they're theatrical studios who are going to have to or and are trying to grow streaming services alongside or streaming services that are trying to create theatrical offerings alongside everyone's going to congregate in some version of that ground where theatrical movies coexist with streams and i think it'll be fine myself i'm optimistic about it i think people will go and see movies and i think movies will be back in business in a big way and when i think to when i was a kid when when you went to see a film you saw it once or maybe twice in the week that it was around in your local cinema and then you wouldn't see it again for probably 10 years if not longer you know it wasn't like there weren't dvds or anything like that uh, uh, it, now it, it, kids experience movies they might watch their, their their movie 30 40 times and they'll watch it they might go to the movies and then they'll they might watch it streamed and might watch it on their phones it, that's technology then that's consumer choice you can't stand against it we have to learn to live in that world and and take the positives that's my view yeah may, may i just add one quick thing to that um I, I do think that this is no, not at all a criticism for streaming at all. As a matter of fact, some of my favorite films that, that, that made recently, recent years are made possible because of streaming services. It's more um, in, when there is a natural disaster, when there's something, a state of emergency, we kind of hope that, you know, our politicians can put their differences aside and come together. And I feel that way about our industry leaders as well. You know, uh, healthy competitions aside, this is a bit of a state of emergency. You know, I, I hope people will still want to go back to the theaters, but will they still be there? I, I just wish that all the leaders and people are in power in our industry, uh, while having their healthy competitions, also have some kind of dialogue, you know, say, uh, say some space aside and talk about longevity, nurturing our industry because our government isn't giving us the funding in, in this type of emergency to preserve culture. And, it, and it's the job of our industry leaders to, to do that, I think. Mm. A lot of um, Warner's filmmakers are upset right now because they learned mm-hmm. from reading in the press that their movies would be released on HBO Max instead of in theaters. The DGA called that, I think, quote, unacceptable in a letter to Ann Sarnoff. I'm curious, I mean, Spike, if you found out that way, that your movie's release plan was changed, how, how would you feel? What would your reaction be? Are people uh, overreacting, or is this an appropriate reaction? Look, people are going to do what they want to do, but uh, you, you can't give somebody a heads up, you know? Mm-hmm. Respect. I mean, why, why are they going to read about it in the trades? Pick up the phone. Mm-hmm. Send a text, mm-hmm. send an email. Is I think that's common decency. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. Yep. Yeah. Between the pandemic, the election, the Black Lives Matter movement, 2020 was a year of major cultural shifts. What do you think are the changes we experienced this year that will be lasting? One of the things that struck me about all the films the, you know, of, of the, of the, that's representative of the directors here, they're all about trying to figure out how you belong in a world where you, do, where, where you no longer belong. Mm. 
and mm. and you know, and I I I I found that incredibly powerful and very moving. <laughs> that you know, you know, seven different people are wrestling with the same dynamic because I think this particular you know the planet is, but this country has really been wrestling with that. And I found I found something about that very reassuring that it's people looking to connect the way they've connected in the past. But the rules have all changed and the landscape has all changed. And so how do you go forward and how do you how do you embody the things that make you so, so fragile and so connected as a human being? How do you preserve that? You know, it's sitting in a dark theater with strangers watching something wondrous or people traveling around landscapes that are that are fraught with violence and and fear and horror and you know it was you know none of us have had a collective conversation but we were all in our own way exploring you know where do i belong how do i defend that which needs to be defended and protected and honored and that i thought was really fascinating oh i, totally I love agree. that I totally agree. yeah well, so, yeah um, one of the changes this year was that the Academy announced some new rules for taking the inclusion of a cast and crew into account when determining whether a film is Oscar eligible. Um, and I'm curious, for those of you who've had a chance to, to think about those rules, do you think they're a good idea? Do they go far enough, uh, too far? Uh, Spike, any thoughts? Why are you calling on me? <laughs> you, because you looked down. <laughs> you looked, you went like this. I knew, I knew right away. You looked coming. down. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I don't understand the rules. I'm not saying they shouldn't be there, but is there a number? I just never been, I don't know exactly what the rules are and what the criteria is. I mean, if so, if you have two black PAs, that, that means you're eligible? What position are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to be funny, but I just don't understand. Maybe I'm going to have to, somebody with the academy will tell me, like, what, how does this thing work? Mm -hmm. That was my first thing. How does this work? Mm -hmm. In all honesty, like Spike, I have not really read through them all, you know, to, to really know in detail. So I think, I don't know who who has that part of this uh, group right now, but it's kind of hard to speak on something when you don't know all of the particulars. I guess in theory, it sounds like um, a great idea to give opportunity to people who don't get the opportunity, who continuously get looked over. But then there's also the thought of how do you fulfill those requirements when you're shooting in Iceland, mm -hmm. you know? Um, <laughs> so uh, they have black in Iceland. I, <laughs> Two. 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 <laughs> um, and and you know, uh, the, there's a very specific relationship between white and black people in America just because of the history of black people coming to America and how we got here. Uh, but when you talk about inclusivity, you know, we're, we're talking about more than just uh, black people. We're talking about women. We're talking about uh, how, how you identify as a gender. So I don't know how all of that plays in the, the rule. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like you, you're kind of getting a bit of silence from everyone when you pose that question, because we're all kind of like, yeah. well, we <laughs> don't really, with Spike said, know quite what it is mm -hmm. they are the rules these new rules are pages long so uh definitely understand people not having them at the ready um it it does seem like the academy is trying to address the issue that comes up often during oscar nominations whereby there are uh seemingly n there's not representation particularly on a lot of the crafts um uh Spike. I think, in my opinion, you rectify this by having those people in the room that I call the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers are the one that decide what film's gonna get made and what film doesn't get made. Not the academy. You have to go 
to, the, to that high rarefied air of the people who have green light votes at studios and networks. They're the ones that have the power. And that's where I love my man, Lynn Lin Manuel. Manuel, you got to be in the room. If we're not in the room, the shit out of luck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great song, too, from Hamilton. <laughs> um, shit out of luck. <laughs> shit out of luck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the next one. Well, <laughs> oh. SOL, for short. SOL, better for the one sheet. George. <laughs> Rebecca, Got also, it. I, I want to I say, I want to give a shout out to my professor, Spike, here, because... You know, change takes time. I spend a lot of times on a, a on a reservation in South Dakota. There's quick changes. People come in and donate a lot of stuff and leave. But there's also a result oriented. But real change takes time. Sustainable change takes time. And you got to build from the ground up. You know, and and mm -hmm. Spike dedicated so much of his years teaching at NYU. Uh, part of the the fight that I had in me, he put it in there as well. You know, so I think it's about education as well. It's about building from the ground up. And that's going to take another generation to see results. Mm -hmm. But those results are the most important ones. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so for those who don't know, Chloe was Spike's student at NYU. Professor isn't just saying something she's saying to, mm -hmm. to be nice. Um, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, so <laughs> we Very are... Very proud of her. I, as as you should be, as you should be. In, in fairness, though, Spike does make us all call him professor. So <laughs> I just want to say. That. <laughs> um, so we're gonna shift gears to. You're funny. You're funny. <laughs> Professional man. Come on. I know. <laughs> Uh, well, that's a perfect segue. We're going to shift gears to some of the closing questions, which are lighter in nature. The first one is, what movies have gotten you through this pandemic? What has been a respite when you needed some escape? Regina, what did you watch? Start with Regina. <laughs> Start with Regina. Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. Oh, movies? It, 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 it has to be a movie? It does not have to be a movie. You, what, whatever made you feel good this past year watching or listening? Um, listening to a lot of music. Uh, so let's go with music. Yeah, that, that's a safe space uh, to go because... Um, I feel like most of the films that I've seen, you know, or we, we're all, George so eloquently pointed out, uh, our, 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 all of our films are, uh, have great questions of uh, human questions that kind of leave you to, to, to think. Uh, um, and not that that's not good, but as far as taking you away, you know, I'm still watching Golden Girls episodes. <laughs> that, 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 that works for me. Um, <laughs> but music wise, um, this group that has been around for a minute, but I just love their music. I've been listening to this group called Tank and the Bangas. And the lead singer is this young woman who just is just vibrant in her voice. Um, um, it, it, she can just do so many different things with her voice. And then I discovered a young woman who just seems like Sarah Vaughn is in Ella Fitzgerald are both living in her body, but Samara Joy, uh, she, if anybody has the opportunity to check her out on YouTube, this girl looks like she's about 16 years old and opens up her mouth and literally it sounds like she is like like if you close your eyes, you would think you're you're hearing Sarah Vaughn, mm -hmm. and you see this face, this beautiful, precious baby, if you will, and just all of this power and emotion comes out. And when I watch her and when I listen to her, it just she just her name is Samara Joy, and she, it brings me joy. Mm. Anybody else have any? Film, show, music, uh, Spike? Well, for, for me, I'm going to I'm gonna piggyback on my sister, Regina. I'm going to add film to your music. 
I've been in musical things. So I'm, I'm in my, I've been in pandemic hours in my Roger the Hammerstein shit. Carousel. Really? Oklahoma. <laughs> Sound of music. <laughs> uh, 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 what am I missing? I'm missing Those some. are some heavy hitters. Mm-hmm. But uh, I find that very unsettling. Oh, South, <laughs> South Pacific. Did I say South Pacific? <laughs> Yeah, South Pacific. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just so that's where I've been. Uh, but then, wow, when it, it stuff will trigger. So when when my favorite 007 passed, where I had to go back to oh. Doctor No. Let me tell you a funny story. <laughs> my mother was a cinephile. Swear to God, she died when I was in Morehouse or sophomore college. But she was, my father hated, my father's a jazz physician, hated movies. My mother loved films, so I'm the eldest. So my mother would drag me to movie theaters. So we, she took me to see Thunderball. So, no, took me to see Goldfinger. So I'm in the movie theater saying like, mommy, why is that lady's name Pussy Galore? <laughs> she said, shut up and watch the movie. <laughs> True story. So I went back to Dr. Joe. I mean, Sean Connery. Oh, my God. I never got to meet him. All right. Next question. Um, what do people think directing is that it isn't? What do people get wrong about directing? Paul, let's start with you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, well, I, I think people think it's easy. I, I remember uh, quite a few years ago, my dad, he's very, very old now, he's about 95, and he, he was at sea all his life. Um, and uh, so he was away quite a bit when I was young. Anyway, he, he I think it was Captain Phillips. We had a screening of Captain Phillips, and I got up and then she said he came. And uh, I made a little speech, and I said, you know, as I get older, I realize that I'm my father's son. And actually directing is a little bit like going to sea because you have a map called a script, and you, you have a crew and you have a cargo, and your job is to get the cargo to port safely on time, and you got to deal with the weather and all the rest of it. I thought it was a very pretty little speech. Uh, <laughs> afterwards, my dad said to me, what are you talking about? He said, I worked every day. I worked properly hard work. It wasn't like all that making movies stuff. That's that's not a real job. <laughs> so there you go. Fair enough. George Clooney, what do people get wrong about directing? I think I think Paul has something. That, that's kind of the idea. They think that directing starts when the movie starts and you say action, and it's over when the movie's over and you say, you know, cut, that's our wrap. You know, and that there's so, you know, there's nine months of prep beforehand and there's you know, a year of post afterwards that I don't think people understand. But, you know, it's a funny thing. I, I have to say, Paul, it is funny to me, too, though, because we'll get in these things, you know, we'll have these conversations sometimes and it will become like, you know, this was really hard. They'll ask me about like being in the snow and they'll be like, was it really hard for you as an actor? And I'm like, yeah, it was hard. But, you know, I used to cut tobacco for a living in Kentucky for three dollars and 30 cents an hour. And <laughs> Uh, I remember watching Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. You remember that show with the, uh, whatever his name was? And, and they, they would always talk about, like, you know, what they were doing was so hard. You know, you'd hear some famous actor go, it's so hard, it's so hard. And I'm, like, sitting there covered in tobacco juice going, it's not that fucking hard, you know. <laughs> because we are doing what we love. I mean, even if you're working 17-hour days, we're doing the thing, we're, we get to be kids. We get to do, all of us here in this room, we get to, get, we love what we do for a living. And so that takes all the work part, as hard as it can be at times, and it makes me still feel guilty to call these things jobs because we love what we do. And most people work for the weekends, you know, and they get to the weekends so they can enjoy them. And so I just feel like, you know, we are lucky in a way, and it's. And by the way, it's really fun. I, 
when you say, what did we watch? I watched your films and I couldn't believe how beautiful they were. And I can't believe what an honor it is to be here with you guys. And and uh, thank you. You know that and money heist and and money heist. Yeah, yeah. I do <laughs> have to say I love. It, but, you know, um, it's just fun. Well, that seems like a a great place to end this. Thank you all so much. This has been a great conversation. For close up with the Hollywood Reporter, I'm Rebecca Keegan. <laughs> <laughs> The slide. Spike is ready. Hi, I'm Brad Pitt. Thanks for watching the Hollywood <laughs> Reporters Roundtable on YouTube. I know I don't look so good, but ever since I won an Oscar, I said, fuck it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Spike Lee. Hi, I'm Chloe Zhao. Hi, my name is Isaac Chung. Hi, I'm Regina King. Hi, my name's Paul Greengrass. Hi, I'm George C. Wolf. Hi, I'm George Clooney, and thank you for watching. Thank you for watching the Hollywood Reporters. The Hollywood Reporter Roundtables on YouTube.